Welcome to Africa Answers, a series featuring young African leaders unpacking topical issues affecting Africa and proposing solutions to challenges. I am Slindilim Lilo, your host. Today I'll be speaking to A. Mohammed A. Foboy from Liberia and we'll be unpacking peace building in Africa. Hi, uh, Mohammed, and welcome. Hi, hi, Slindilim, and thank you for the invitation to sit on this platform. Great. I'm really excited to be speaking to you about this topic. Um, and let's just get right into it, right? Um, I'm quite interested in your experience. What, what inspired you or what led you to get into this uh, space of peace building and uh, conflict prevention? Okay, so I, I was born during the period uh, of the Liberian Civil War, and I uh, that's in the late 1980s. And uh, growing up in the world, I had my first 14 years. So I grew up in gun violence or in armed conflict. And I didn't want what I experienced as a child, other people, a generation coming after me, I to experience such. Like I didn't have a childhood. So in preventing that, I had to get involved uh, with different uh, international organizations, uh, community initiatives uh, to prevent uh, gun violence and armed, armed conflict. So I, back in fast forward in 2008, so I established uh, work with other young people and students uh, to form uh, what we call uh, students against disruptive actions and decisions. Mm -hmm. Then to work with uh, campus-based organizations, students and other national stakeholders uh, to prevent uh, violence on campus and also academic malpractices. And that's how I got involved with different initiatives. And when I graduated from high school, so we registered uh, this organization and we rebranded it to looking into the future. Mm -hmm. lived Liberia. So moving away from the past of violence and moving into a more productive and peaceful and coherent uh, uh, society in, in the future. So all of those things, moving around, walking and visiting I guess, school, organized events and seeing what was happening then, I uh, so it inspired me to get involved uh, in peace building, peace and security, youth peace and security, and the inclusion of every sector uh, in the Liberian society. And so uh, then I started working with other institutions such as UNOI, so uh, on the global and continental scene. Mm. Yeah. So, um, you know, as somebody who's experienced or lived through armed conflict, what are the effects that it can have on, on people at an individual level? So, uh, so it, took, uh, it takes away your childhood, as uh, it did uh, to me. So uh, 14 years after the Liberian Civil War, like 2003, I was like around, I was just in grade, grade, grade five. And like, so not, so the economic incentives, uh, uh, that come uh, with peace and security in the country. So it takes away all of those things. So sometimes children get missing uh, in the midst of that. And I can tell you, like, between 1989 to 2003, when the war started and ended, I think I lived uh, between more than, like, maybe up to 10 communities, like, just moving from one place to another and I didn't know what my parents went through, but I know it was a difficult uh, period uh, for them. And so I didn't go to school many times. So there was uh, I breaks between. So I, I can clearly say when I got to know myself, uh, between 1999 uh, to 2005, I didn't go to school uh, because of the armed conflict. We were moving from one place to another. So I lost my father through the process. So my mother became a single a single mother, a single parent. So at the individual level, it, it takes away so many things away from you, your agency, your freedom, your personal development, and your childhood. Yeah, yeah. 
I'm sorry about the loss of your father. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. No, thanks. Thanks for that. I mean, like you really painted a, a picture of, of, you know, the, the effects that, um, you know, conflict can have, like at a sort of like personal level, right? So when mm -hmm. people are consuming, you know, um, what's happening around, sometimes we, we don't have a visualization of what are the actually people who are affected, what are they going through? So leading to that, um, and coming from a country that is, has experienced conflict, what do you think are the causes of, 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 of conflict in Africa? And where are we right now? Uh, the causes of conflict are in Africa. So uh, and I, I know a lot of time that we people tend to use this, but it's, it's to be honest, I, in conf and, and conflict is not synonymous uh, to Africa. Africa has not monopolized our uh, armed um, conflict. Uh, yeah, so there are conflicts uh, in other regions of the world, whether it's in Latin America, uh, in Asia, and even in Europe. And Europe uh, fought uh, some of the longest uh, uh, war uh, in human history. Uh, but within the African context, uh, so uh, conflict evolved. So from a uh, colonial period, a uh, post-colonial period, uh, the, during the Cold War, post uh, Cold War period, so we we can attribute uh, conflict because there are conflicts uh, almost everywhere on the African continent uh, within the different uh, five regions: uh, west, south, east, west, and uh, central. So I can say number one is the arbitrary creation of borders uh, by colonial, colonial powers and masters. And this arbitrary creation of borders led uh, to uh, the composition of states uh, mixing different ethnic groups, and that led uh, to countries fighting for legitimacy, uh, fighting for some level of supremacy and, and, and liberation movements across Africa. Mm -hmm. So the arbitrary uh, creation of borders, the uh, compositions of different states, and also uh, poverty, and maybe external debt uh, burden, inept uh, political leadership and corruption. So I think these are the main causes of conflicts uh, currently uh, in Africa from the 1960s and coming uh, to war. So during the period of the Cold War, we have proxy wars, uh, like I can of course say the Liberian Civil War, I think it was a proxy war. We have wars in, 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 in other places. So I, after the, the colonial master left Africa, I think the, the, the conflict between, which was a, like an interstate uh, conflict. So we have the interstate conflict, we have the intrastate conflict, and we have transnational conflict, or maybe insurgency, violent extremism, where we have violent groups like Boko Haram uh, operating uh, between or among countries, whether it's in Chad, uh, in, the, in, in Cameroon, or in, 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 in Nigeria. Then we have uh, Al-Shabaab and Al-Qaeda working uh, within Eastern Africa, in Somalia, uh, in Kenya, in Sudan, and other places. So people fighting for legitimacy, people fighting uh, for a control of political power and, 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 and resources. So all of them, and the lack of uh, strong institutions, uh, like the rule of law. So all of these things uh, cause a uh, conflict uh, in Africa. Yeah, yeah. And I love that uh, you premised your, your response by saying uh, conflict is not synonymous uh, with Africa. But uh, given that, where, where are we? What is the state of uh, conflict in Africa? I so thought there are, uh, we still have some conflicts uh, within Africa. Uh, we don't have that many. I can, I can outrightly say that we have interstate conflicts mm -hmm. uh, within Africa, although there are allegations like the war in, in the Tigray region where uh, some scholars and different in international institutions have, have speculated that uh, maybe Eritrea is involved uh, in the conflict that makes it uh, 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 an interstate conflict. And of course now with the Pretoria uh, peace agreement, at least there's a ceasefire and a political agreement. So there's also conflict uh, in, the, in Eastern DRC uh, and People have accused uh, Rwanda of being involved uh, with that. So I think if 
hold you all factor constant if they are evident to prove that those or these countries are involved in, in, in those conflicts, then we can say maybe those are inter interstate conflict. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to intrastate conflict, so civil war, yes, of course, the Eritrean war uh, is, is, is one of Eritrean body war in Ethiopia and the Tigray region is one. And of course, thank God now that we have a ceasefire. So we have a very prolonged war in Sudan, uh, in, 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 in the Darfur region, in Somalia, in South Sudan. And there are still a number of uh, insurgency and violent extremism across uh, different countries, uh, different non-state actors, uh, terrorist group are uh, working, uh, uh, launching uh, 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 attacks uh, in different regions of, 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 of Africa, whether it's in the Sahel, uh, whether it's in the Lake Char Basin or in the Great Lake uh, region. So we still have a number of uh, interested conf in, yeah, interested conflict in Africa, but also transnational insurgency in Africa. Africa. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, um, given the picture that you painted before, right, of the effects that conflict has at a personal level, are these wars justified? I mean, you mentioned that one of the causes is uh, people fighting for legitimacy, right? But when you look at the, the effects of the conflict at the end of the day, are they justified? Uh, I think politically, politically, people will always say war is justified, some people, uh, but I don't think any war is justified because there is more we can gain when we have peace, so we eradicate poverty, the money we're supposed to spend in, in emergency or during wartime, uh, international institutions, I can spend that uh, to bring development, so to attract uh, foreign direct investment uh, into the country, as I said, to eradicate poverty to strengthen a uh, political and economic institution and I uh, to, 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 to develop our different infrastructure because you know of course doing war like Liberia we fought mm. 14 years and what Liberia was uh, from the uh, from the 19th century back in 1822 to 1989 all of those uh, infrastructures uh, were destroyed and I mean, we have had, since after the war, we have had more than 18 years uh, since uh, the, war, the war ended, but we have not been able uh, to rebuild the country. So no one under any condition can say the war was justified because even all of those things that, was, that, 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 that happened or that were the cause of the war are all still happening. And so why are we not still going back to war? Because we believe that war is not the answer. We must be able to dialogue, we must be able to engage, and we must be able to have an inclusive political and economic institutions uh, that include every sector of the society. And, and that's one thing when I talk about inept uh, political leadership, because you know, a lot of African leaders or leaders of other places that they, when, 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 when they have political offices, they tend uh, to tribalize our uh, national institution. They tend to ethnicize our uh, political institution. And other people then uh, become, uh, they say, okay, we, the society become unequal. Other people become disgruntled and they say, okay, come on, the, the state is, is for all of us. So we cannot uh, be left uh, behind or, or left out of decision-making process. Then they tend to wage war. So we have nationalist uh, Malaysians or people with nationalist agenda and they want to have uh, control. Like, of course, the war we had in the Tigray region uh, between the um, Amhara or the Oromo. So it is more of a, a, a conflict of, 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 of ethnic uh, orientation. So of course, we cannot say war is justified and war cannot be justified. 100%. Um, now, moving to interventions, right? I mean, you've taken, through, you've taken us through some of the causes, the effects that it has, and obviously your closing statement to say war is not justified, right? So what are the interventions then? What, what, what should we be doing or what is being done or what has been done to try and prevent armed conflict? Uh, so, uh, from the global level, uh, which I will not spend much time on, of course, we have uh, the United Nations coming out of uh, World War II in 1985 through mm -hmm. the Transatlantic uh, Treaty mm -hmm. uh, between different winners of the war then. And uh, so the United Nations had different chapters, uh, different instruments uh, that 
give power to regional organizations or regional economic communities uh, to intervene and, and make sure that the war is prevented, uh, to ensure global peace, to make sure that we don't go back uh, uh, to the 1914 World War One and uh, back to the 1939 World War Two and the different war. Whether the United Nations has been able to achieve uh, global peace and to prevent uh, uh, war or chaos, I mean, it's another debate for another time. But regionally, I, I believe there are a lot of different instruments uh, at the African Union level. Uh, so we have uh, the African Union has been able uh, to develop and adopt uh, different uh, regional uh, instruments like, like uh, the African Governance Architectural. African Governance Architectural uh, was adopted by member states of the African Union to ensure uh, uh, fair society, so uh, to strengthen democracy, to strengthen the rule of law, uh, to the, the, the respect uh, for, for fundamental human rights, uh, so the right to religion, right to freedom of expression, uh, to strengthen the fourth layer of society, the governance, uh, freedom of the press, and all of those things. And we also have the African uh, Peace and Security Architectural uh, to also ensure that uh, states within Africa, because when Africa uh, coming out of uh, the, the, the OAU in 1963, yeah, so the, when the OAU was founded, the basic principle of the Organization for Africa Unity then was the liberation of Africa, and they had these basic principles of uh, the principles of non-interference, uh, where African states were left on their own to do whatever they need to do. Of course, yes, as uh, Peace and security is internal, especially at the primary level, must be taken care of by national government. But transitioning uh, from the OAU to the AU in 2001 and two, when the AU was established, so they left from the principle of non-interference to the principles of non-indifference. So that, yes, you have your principles of self-determination and territorial integrity, but you also have the, 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 the responsibility to protect uh, your citizens, to ensure that a uh, genocide doesn't happen, to, to, to ensure that their fundamental human rights are respected. So the principle of non-indifference I, I brought about the, the, the African peace and security architecture to strengthen security institutions, especially especially the police, uh, which is a power military, but also the military, that the police will not be the first point of intervention. And that has caused a lot of uh, war uh, uh, uprising uh, in, in, in different countries because during election, when results are contested, instead of having the police to intervene to protect life and property, because that's the core responsibility of the police, while the military is there to defend uh, the state. So we have African leaders giving mandate to the military to, end up, to intervene first. And when the military go there, sometimes these military are uh, ethnicized, so the whole allegiance not to the state, uh, but to the, the, the president or the power that be this neo-patrimonial uh, start of leadership and governance. So the African Peace and Security Architectural has been able to develop early warning system uh, regionally at the, the SADC level, the, the, the West African level, the East African level, so the early sign of conflict, so if this country is not respecting its citizens, if this, conf if, if this country is not uh, equitably distributing uh, the gains uh, from, na from, from national resources, maybe international institutions uh, can intervene uh, to see how they can, they, 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 they can advise. So it's not just you as a state say I have the absolute power over violence, like the formation of state where I, I especially sociologists say, okay, every state, uh, you must have the absolute power of violence and, and, and everything. So now other regional institutions like ECOWAS, of course, that intervened during the Liberian Civil War in the United Nations or the African Union that is intervening currently uh, in, in, in Mali or in, in, in Sudan and Somalia. So all of them, they get involved to strengthen these different state institutions make sure that the security institutions are independent and they don't become an instrument of leaders to be used against the state. So I think these different these different uh, uh, institutions and interventions uh, 
they are one way or the other are trying to prevent an armed conflict around Africa, but the core responsibility of peace and security lies uh, within, uh, with, within states or off the state to ensure that their mm. citizens are protected. Yeah. I mean, uh, on the ground, what are what initiatives could be done or sh are going on? Because we know that yes, intervention at state level, at regional level, at international level, right? But as somebody who's working uh, around peace building initiatives on the ground, what are some of the best practices that you're seeing that are assisting in terms of making sure that we're sustaining this peace that we're trying to build? Uh, intergenerational dialogue, uh, intersectional dialogue, so, so different demographics and in, in, in sectors of the society. So we must engage uh, the religious community. We must ensure that everyone, I mean, inclusivity is, is, is key because when people feel being out, of the system, when they feel being denied access to what uh, that they are entitled to, like the national resources, uh, political positions, common social and tribal or ethnic cleavages, I uh, will be formed, and people will now tend to 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 uh, to defend their own society, their own or community, I uh, to say, or their own ethnic group and religion, and we have to be very mindful of uh, characterization and label in different uh, conflicts uh, when 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 they arise. So we. We, we must engage every sector of the society, like uh, what the uh, United Nations, I uh, through the different resolution on women, peace and security, on youth, peace and security. I, I, so we, 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 we must respect those international, national and regional in instruments uh, to include everyone. So we must knowledge is power. We must educate our people. We, we, we must empower them with the necessary skills because people always say an angry man, a hungry man is an angry man. Mm. So if you don't empower your citizens, if you don't provide them quality education and they are left in an idle state, politicians and other individuals will come and utilize their idleness. Mm. And of course, they will say, come on, if, if I'm in Liberia, I have been in Liberia, or I'm, I'm in Somalia, or in South Africa, or Zimbabwe, and I, I believe that my rights are taken away from me, that anyone in power can do anything to me, they can, they can arrest me arbitrarily, or people are misusing and embezzling resources. Anyone who comes as an alternative, whether it, it is through violence, I'm going to accept them because I'm already angry with the justice system, already angry with the political institutions, I'm angry with the rule of law. I don't have justice when, when any, anybody can do anything to me at any time. So if if we educate people for them I to have the exposure and alternative to employment, I think we will be able because come on, whatever we can do at the international and regional level, if people within their different states uh, like they are poor, they can be used anytime. So economic empowerment, strengthening political institution, inclusivity, and also engage people. Leave no one behind. I know this is this is a a, a term used across different sectors, whether it's in education, whether it's in justice, whether it's in economic uh, equality, gender equality. So I think we must include everyone within uh, within the context of, of state building and in, uh, uh, in, in a governance structure and engage people. Let the older people talk to the younger ones. The younger one must not just come and say, I mean, this is our time. We have, uh, the, you know, we have that term in Liberia. The younger one has as they are more in, in enthusiastic about the future, they must be able to learn from the older ones. And the older ones must not see the younger ones as threat. No religion. Come on. I was born and I didn't choose to be a Muslim. So and if, if I were a Christian, I would be happy. That's why a lot of time and at a personal level, people will always ask me, Mohammed, are you a, are you a Shia or a Sunni? The first time I even I even got that or even learned that there was a Shia or Sunni when I went to the Netherlands and like I when I went to immigration, they were like, are you a Shia or a Muslim? I don't, come on, I don't, I don't know. I don't care whether I'm a Shia or a Muslim. I'm a, I'm a Shia or Sunni, rather. I'm a Muslim. 
And I don't care who's a Christian. I don't care who's a Buddhist because that is between me and my God. So people must be able to tolerate each other. We must tolerance is at the heart because diversity brings so much on the table. If you are a Muslim, I'm a Christian. You are a male. I'm a female. And we bring those different ideas together. We bring half of the society together and we have the other half. We will be able to make informed decisions that affect every aspect of society. But if you only have men around the table discussing things that affect 50% of the population, come on, you're going to make decisions that will exclude 50% of the population. Or you're going to uh, make decisions that will exclude another religion. And tomorrow, if they realize that, come on, I'm excluded, they're going to find an alternative. And that alternative can be through violent conflict because they are angry. And that, mm. but that time when people, that, that's the time when people say, oh, yeah, war is justified mm. because other people feel excluded from, 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 from the governance of the state. Mm. They all have equal access and right to the, nat to the natural resources of the state. And they are not given, if they are not given their, 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 their share of the national cake, they will always find alternative to that. Yeah, yeah, wow. Still on the topic of armed conflict, right? What is your take on um, extremism and terrorism? Right. Um, what is currently happening there? What are we seeing and how do we prevent this? Oh, um, extremism and terrorism is a delicate uh, issue when it comes to peace and security. It's controversial. It's, it's political. And I, I, I always tell our colleagues when we are discussing I violent extremism or what motivate our people. We have to be very mindful. And I always love this, the, the discussing counter terrorism mechanism rather than even discussing the whole issue of our, our terrorism. And what do we do? And there's, there's this argument about decapitation or de radicalization. What drives people? What, what terrorists want to achieve? And if we, if if we tend uh, to politically, or not politically, yeah, politically, ethnically, and religiously, I label them uh, for political convenience or whatever political motive we have, they, they use that as a leverage. So they leverage that to mobilize, because if you mobilize, if, if you label Boko Haram as, uh, as an Islamic terrorist organization, they are going to use that to mobilize the, uh, what do I call that, the Muslims. And they say, okay, come on, it's us versus them. I mean, the clash of civilization, right, of, of Samuel Huntington. Uh, so the different clashes between cultures and civilization. So they are going to use that to mobilize their communities. And you tend to put your own peace and security or your, the, the peace and security of your people and your country at risk because you look at like 1.8 billion uh, people or half of the world population to say, you tend to put them against the other. If you also use the same, maybe LRA, the law, the, the, the law resistant army, uh, and you say it's a Christian uh, organization, come on, they're also going to use that to, to mobilize other, other sector of, 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 of community. So we have to be very mindful. And a lot of time, for me, I always choose the path of de-radicalization. How do we I enter the, the sales of terrorist organizations? How do we prevent our people, especially young people, from being recruited and mobilized by these extreme organizations or by uh, stopping and preventing them to go on the extreme. And we, we have to provide uh, opportunities for young people. We have to be very inclusive. And I always draw, bring, bring, talk about, emphasize the issue of inclusive uh, society. Come on, if everyone feels part of the society, there will be, they, they will have, no right, or they, they will see no justification uh, to reign a uh, terror against their own people. But if you tend to exclude other sectors of society, other communities of, 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 of society, people are going to use that because they are saying, okay, come on, the, the Muslims are against the Christians, or the Christians are against the Muslims, then it becomes a religious war. So I think it's more of a political, economic, and social issues rather than more of ethnic or, or religious mm -hmm. issue. And by, by, by doing that, uh, 
I we must not militarize our preventing violent extremism. It's more we must be able to engage it from a social angle than from a more security and political angle because it's not an issue of 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 of, of people and be Muslim or Christian. It's the issue of people not having access to justice. Mm -hmm. It's the people, it's the issue of people being left outside of, 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 of decision-making processes. It's of people, it's of discrimination. So if I'm in a society or I'm in a country of, of that is dominated by Muslims and I'm a Christian and I believe or think that yes, uh, this society is very unfair to me, even though I'm a national, I'm a citizen of that society, I'm going to mobilize my people and I'm going to reign terror on my own state. So like Boko Haram is doing, like other, other, other violent organizations and institutions are doing, but we must be able to bring everyone, have a dialogue and be able to inclusively and holistically solve and address our issues, people concerns, uh, what 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 their concerns are, what are the issues that divide them, and let us be able to have an inclusive society that respect the rights of everyone. Yeah, yeah. So when we talk about armed conflict, um, I think one important um, element that also needs to be brought to light is the issue of children, right? Mm -hmm. um, we've often seen cases where children are recruited to fight in these armed conflict, right? where their childhood is stripped away from them. So what is being done in that space? Are there policies, is there legislation that is being uh, you know, implemented to ensure that you know, such practices are abolished? Yeah, so there are a lot of international instruments like the Convention on the Rights of the Child, uh, the African uh, Convention on, 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 on the Rights of the Child and different in international, regional and national uh, instruments. And of course, I mean, coming from West Africa or Liberia, I mean, I have experienced that firsthand uh, during the Liberian conflict and even the Sierra Leone conflict because Liberia, uh, Sierra Leone, where we, we, we have some similarities when it, come, uh, when it comes to uh, armed conflict. So children were recruited. And as you said, their childhood uh, will be taken away from them. They are recruited as child soldiers and they, they are used against uh, their will uh, because even if they accept uh, to, to hold conflict uh, to hold gun rather to carry on and participate in the war. Come on, they are minors, they are underage. So there's not that informed uh, decision. They don't have the ability, the maturity uh, to make an informed decision. So they are being used uh, by actors to participate uh, in, a, in a war or in a conflict that they don't even know why, why, why the conflict is happening. So I, I think I it, it takes away their childhood. It takes away so much, not just not just individually, but it takes away the the, uh, the, the society. Doing the uh, it takes away so much opportunities uh, away from the society. During the Liberian Civil War, we had more than uh, uh, seventy thousand, seven hundred thousand people being displaced. Uh, we have more than two hundred and fifty thousand people uh, being killed. I mean, you take away the human resource and the capacity of the state. These, those people that were killed are those people that left the country, that the country is now suffering from brain, brain drain, which is not synonymous to Liberia alone, but other African country, uh, countries rather. So that capacity to contribute to the growth and development of the state is taken away and is referred or transferred to other states. Those, 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 those citizens or Liberians or other nationals in other countries now, the diaspora community, they are, even though they have some positive impact like remittances and other things, but the issue of green drain. So they are scientists in other countries. And why in Liberia, maybe we have about a thousand or maybe 10 to 20,000 patients to one doctor, maybe even more, more body that while we have surplus of nurses, of doctors, of different people, different skills uh, in other countries, while the country of origin, they are there, they don't have those basic social services because they don't have the capacity and skills uh, to respond uh, to the needs of the citizens. So, and that happened from the early stage of development. So, conflict does not just have a direct uh, impact on the lives of children, but an indirect impact on the lives and, and of, of the children in the society. Because conflict, of course, children being born in conflict, if they are not resilient enough, like, 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 like me or other children, they will not be able, illiteracy rate will, 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 will increase. 
And as long as you have electricity rate increase uh, on a high, uh, at the peak in any society, you will have poverty. You will have poverty. You will have youth, youth, youth unemployment. Because, of course, the basic of development happens between age, maybe age zero to nine years. So early childhood development is key. We must invest in quality education. So if kids during their childhood are unable to go to, to go to school, are unable to access quality education because of civil war, because they were participating in conflict, carrying guns, are killing their own people, including maybe their own family member, you are not just taking away the agencies of those children and their self-efficacy, but you are taking away some economic and security incentives from the state. And you are going, that has a very long term term impact and no reason I mean we are why today no wonder why Africa is the poorest region or uh, the poorest region of the world uh, as, as reported by the the the, 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 the UN SDG re, uh, re, 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 report uh, yes the, the SDG report so Africa Southeast Asia those regions are very poor because they are undergoing some level of conflict whether it's structural violence and those structural violence leads to a uh, violent armed conflict yeah yeah. So, wow. Yeah. <laughs> you really said a lot of uh, interesting stuff, uh, things that we really need to be paying attention to. Right. Um, but when it's all said and done, what is your wish for Africa? How do we move forward and ensure that we prevent conflict in the future? <sighs> Let us not give up. And that's why we are here. You are here participating in a young African Leaders Program, a fellowship here at the SDG, EUI, I'm here. We must take responsibility of the future of Africa. We cannot continue to complain. We cannot continue to just blame our leaders. And when we are given the opportunities, we do same as our leaders. So the young people of Africa, the average age, of Africa, the youngest continent is 19. So that has huge prospect for the future of Africa. We have more than 30% of the world natural resources, more than 60% of arable land. Like West Africa alone, Liberia alone has about more than 50% uh, of the West African forest. These are assets. Let us leverage those assets. Let us build our capacity. Let us script in state institutions. The major cause for conflict in Africa, for poverty in Africa, is because institutions are surrounded by individuals. Yes, the president and his cycle of sick offense, what is in South Africa, in Liberia, in Kenya, in Zimbabwe, in Rwanda, they make the decision. No one is willing to tell a president that what you are doing is not right. Because he or she believes when he does that, he or she does that, he's going to be fired. Or even maybe his safety will be at risk. So we are not, we are not willing to risk our future or our personal safety for the collective security and progress of society. So I challenge young people, whatever is happening at the African Union, at ECOWAS, at SADC, and other regional economic communities and multilateral organizations within Africa, the future, I see a brighter future. And that future, I see it is because you and I are here. It is because 19 or 25 young leaders from across Africa are here from 19 countries graduating from this program and all the other programs like the Yali Fellowship, the Ola Fellowship, the Mo Ibrahim Iskala program at Chatham House and other institutions. The war is invested in Africa. We must not betray them. We must, after five, 10 years, our countries must be better off than what it is now because of African leaders. And these leaders must not follow the full step of the current generation of leaders. The current generation of leaders that have entrapped Africans into poverty, that have entrapped Africans into diseases, 
that have entrapped African into farming. And somebody was telling me farming is a natural disaster. No, why is Africa not able to feed itself? Why is Africa not able to feed itself? If we have vast majority of land, of forest, but today we are depending on countries that are even fighting war to export food to Africa. Currently, there's a food crisis in, our, in Liberia where citizens are sleeping in the street just to get a 25 kg a bag of rice. These things must stop. And that prospect, that hope, lies with you and I. We, getting international offices or positions, whether it's in the private and, and public sector, we must be accountable to our people. When we are in offices, we must see ourselves as holder of those offices, the immunities, the opportunities, the privileges that come with those offices must not be seen through us, must be seen in those offices. Because if you are calling, if you are being called Madame today, you are being called Madame because you are the Minister of that, you are the Minister of Defense, the Minister of Finance. Know that in two, three years, you will not be called Madame. Someone opening door for you today will not open door for you tomorrow. So you must be able to be accountable to the people opening doors for you. You must be able to provide leadership for them. You must be able to create opportunities for citizens not to be followers, but to be innovative and creative. Because if they are just followers, you are just, you, if they are just followers, you are taking away their agency from them. You are taking away their development from them because you only want them to worship you. And Africa was not developed like that. A leader must be a, a minister or civil servant must be able to say, I am resigning today because this, this government, I believe, is not effective. I believe because this government is not living up to the social contract of the people. And you, because you believe you are educated and you resign today, you will have other opportunities for employment. And I believe that's why our current leaders are holding the young people back are holding Africans back because they don't want to provide them opportunities. They want them to keep being our followers and seek offense. They don't want them to be innovative. They don't want them to be independent thinkers. But you and I have the challenge to create the next generation of leaders coming after us must be independent thinkers, must think beyond their cycle, must think be, uh, uh, out of the box and create opportunities for the next generation of leaders or citizens that are coming so that what you and I are suffering today will other people coming after us will not have to live through those pains. Thank you. Thank you, A. Mohammed, A. for boy. Uh, in closing, what have you learned during your time here in Florence that you will take away back to Liberia? Uh, I have learned uh, tolerance. I have learned their diversity brings so much different ideas. I mean, we had the opportunity to visit our European Union institutions, and we saw how those institutions are set up. We have been able to learn transnational governance, different issues of climate change, of governance, of democracy, of different thematic areas. And I believe those skills must be uh, transferable into actions or must be transferred uh, into actions. We must not just go and sit, as I said, to continue doing what our current leaders are doing because it will be a disappointment. I think we don't want the European Union uh, to regret spending the millions of dollars or euro they are spending on us today. Let us go out in Africa to change Africa for the better. Thank you, A. Mohammed, A. for boy. <laughs> it's been a pleasure endeavor. talking to you, and I wish you all the best. And I can't wait for you to, or we can't wait to see you become the leader that you're urging all of us to become. Yes, I hope so. Thank you.